we're now going to go to a totally different subject. I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephen Brusatti. He's not going to stand in the he's going to stand in the light. Stephen's a Chancellor's Fellow in the School of Geoscience at the University of Edinburgh, and he's a vertebrate paleontologist. And he's an evolutionary biologist, and he specialises in the anatomy, genealogy, and evolution of fossil vertebrates. His particular research focuses dinosaurs, um, but he also studies mammals, crocodiles, and other groups. I just know what those other groups are. Amongst his specialist research subjects are the rise of dinosaurs to dominance during the Triassic period, about 250, 200 million years ago, the evolution and genealogy of carnivorous dinosaurs, the evolution of birds from the carnivorous dinosaurs, and then the extinction of dinosaurs. That seems to pretty much cover dinosaurs, actually, doesn't it? From the <laughs> that does it. The beginning That's why we're end. going on to mammals and crocs. Yeah. He's written 78 peer-reviewed papers, including three in science, two in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. He's the author of five books, including the academic textbook Dinosaur Paleobiology. He's named over 15 new species of fossil vertebrate, including four new species of tyrannosaurs, and he's going to tell you what those names are because I'm not going to read them out, so <laughs> we'll get to that later. He's undertaken fieldwork in many places around the world, including the Western United States, China, Tibet, UK, Romania, Portugal, Poland, and Lithuania. His research is currently funded by the European Commission, the Royal Society of London, and the National Science Foundation in the US. Steve's got an undergraduate degree in geophysical sciences from the University of Chicago, a master's in paleobiology from the University of Bristol, and a PhD in earth and environmental sciences from Columbia University in New York. His research is frequently profiled by the popular press. He often appears on radio and television. And I was very interested to see, the last thing I'm going to tell you about Steve is that he's the resident paleontologist for the BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs programme and was a scientific consultant on the 2013 blockbuster Walking with Dinosaurs 3D cinema release. So would you join me in welcoming <laughs> Stephen? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. If we have any time left, uh, we can talk about Tyrannosaurs. <laughs> All right. So how about this? Lie fi to Tyrannosaurs. So this was great. And hopefully I can follow up uh, Professor Hass's talk with something very different. And that is one of my research focuses, I think the most incredible, amazing, iconic dinosaurs of all, Tyrannosaurs. T-Rex and about 25, 30 of its closest relatives, meat-eating carnivorous dinosaurs that were around for a long period of time, of course are thankfully extinct today, but a group that we're learning more and more and more about every year. So this is what I do for a living. I study dinosaurs and other groups, but particularly dinosaurs. And it's an incredible time to study dinosaurs. We now know of over 1,200 different species of dinosaurs. As you'll see a little bit later, we are finding them at such an incredible pace right now. And there were all kinds of dinosaurs that lived from the time that they originated about 240, 230 million years ago until the time that most of them went extinct about 66 million years ago. And here are just some of the, the more familiar dinosaurs of all. I get to do it here in Edinburgh, which is great. Obviously, you can tell from the way I talk, I am not a native Scot. <laughs> I'm an adopted Scot. But it's a great place to study paleontology. There is such a legacy of paleontology at this university and in this country. Some of the most important fossils in the world come from Scotland. Not so many dinosaurs. We're trying to change that. But there's a long, long legacy of people studying paleontology here. So I'm, it's been really great over the last couple of years to start building up my research group and uh, become part of this history. So all right, enough about that. So let's talk about tyrannosaurs, all right? That's what we're here to do. So this is T-Rex. I think we all know T-Rex. I think you could show this picture to almost anybody out on the street, any kindergartner for sure, and they would know it's T-Rex. This is the biggest, baddest, meanest dinosaur of all, the biggest predator to ever live on land. 13 meters long, five or six tons, size of a double-decker bus, whatever hyperbole you want to use. This was it. Tyrannosaurs are a group that really fascinate me. I can't help but being fascinated by them. They are my favorite dinosaurs. It's a little bit cliched. But I've worked on them quite a bit over the last 10 years or so, and I've been very privileged to be part of some excellent research teams that have been able to describe and name and discover four new tyrannosaurs, these tyrannosaurs here. And we're going to talk in particular later today about a couple of these, Pinocchio Rex, Chongosaurus, and 
Haley Aramis, but we've also worked on a couple others and we have a few more that we're working on now because, as you'll see, we are learning so much more about tyrannosaurs literally every month. A big part of my work has been not just to find new tyrannosaurs and describe them, but to study their genealogy and their evolution. So a huge focus is putting together a family tree of tyrannosaurs. That's basically what I'm going to talk about today, is how we've fleshed out this family tree, particularly over the last 10 years or so. And then when we have a family tree, the, the reason we do this is the same reason why a lot of us, I think, uh, build family trees for our own families. We're interested in our history. We want to know where we came from. We want to know how our families changed over time, how they moved around, how our different ancestors got together. And so that's the same reason we do this for fossils. It helps us understand evolution because ultimately that's why fossils are important. This is how we know about how evolution works over vast timescales, millions and millions of years, timescales we just can't observe today. And tyrannosaurs are a great group for studying evolution because, as we'll see, there's a lot of them. We're finding more and more of them. We have a lot of really good fossils. And, of course, they're very, very popular. They lived a long time. A great group to study. All right, so let's go to the beginning. Let's start telling the story from where it all began about 100 years ago. And this is when the first tyrannosaur, the most iconic tyrannosaur of all, T-Rex, was discovered. So T-Rex has only been known for a little over 100 years. And much of the credit, well, some of the credit, actually probably far too much of the credit, goes to this guy here, this very aristocratic looking gentleman, very nice mustache like people had at that time, Henry Fairfield Osborne very well-known paleontologist in New York at the American Museum where I did my PhD and where E, one of our postdoc fellows, did her PhD. Every day we'd walk in this entrance. Great place to work, biggest dinosaur collection in the world. A lot of that is because of this guy Osborne who got it started. Now he wasn't any old scientist. He wasn't like you or me. This guy had a father who owned a bunch of railroads. He had more money than he knew what he could do with. Uh, and he also, unfortunately, was not the most pleasant individual. He was a rich white guy at a time when they had all kinds of interesting opinions. So he was the president of the Eugenic Society in the U.S. <laughs> he had some very intriguing racial views. Let's just say that he actually sent expeditions to Asia with the express purpose of trying to find the oldest humans to prove that humans didn't come from Africa. Not the nicest guy, but a very prominent scientist. Not many scientists make the cover of Time Magazine. I guess Professor Haas, has, we've learned, has been in Time Magazine, so maybe a few more <laughs> actually can. But this guy was on the cover because he was so well known, president of the American Museum, one of the most visible scientists in the US. Now, he didn't do a whole lot of field work himself, but he was a paleontologist, and he would send people out into the field to collect dinosaurs for him. And so during the turn of the last century, around 1900, he started to send out people to the western US to some of the best places in the world to find dinosaur bones, in particular to the state of Montana, way up there in the northwestern corner of the US. And he sent this guy out there, a guy with a really funny name of Barnum Brown, actually named after the circus guy, P.T. Barnum. Barnum Brown was one of the most unusual, colorful people in the whole history of paleontology. One of the greatest fossil hunters that ever lived, a guy with a nose for fossils. He found some of the best known dinosaurs ever. But a strange guy, he would do field work in the summer in a mink coat, why not? It's not hot enough in Montana. He, uh, he was a spy during both world wars. He uh, worked for oil companies and actually was, uh, did a, quite a bit of sabotage. When he was out looking for fossils, he'd find fossils by day and uh, steal information and even sometimes destroy oil wells by night. Interesting character. He has offspring all over the American West, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but a great fossil hunter, maybe one of the best fossil hunters of all time. And in about 1902, he was sent out by Osborne to Montana to find dinosaurs, and he found a dinosaur, an incredible dinosaur, this dinosaur, which immediately made headlines. And a few years later, Osborne described it in this publication, 
and called it Tyrannosaurus rex, the tyrant dinosaur king, the biggest predatory dinosaur that had ever been found. And this did cause a sensation at the time because no other dinosaur at all like this had been discovered. There had been smaller meat eaters that had been found, but nothing quite of this size. That's why he gave it this dramatic name. T-Rex came from right at the end of the Cretaceous, 66, 67 million years old. They didn't quite know that at the time. We now know that because we have more precise radiometric dating of rocks. But this was one of the last surviving dinosaurs of all. This was a dinosaur that actually would have witnessed the asteroid impact that knocked off most of the dinosaurs 66 <coughs> million years ago. So T-Rex, this sensational dinosaur that Brown found, that Osborne described, amazing dinosaur, but one of the last surviving ones of all. And dinosaurs, as I mentioned, originated long time before. So T-Rex was really just kind of part of the end game of dinosaurs. And so this led to a lot of questions. We didn't know nearly as much about dinosaurs back then as we do now. But of course, people wanted to know where did this incredible 13 meter long, five ton dinosaur come from? What did it evolve from? Did they live earlier in time? Nobody knew. All we had was this colossus right from the end of the Cretaceous. Over the next 75 years or so, people started to find more as we do all the time in paleontology. People fanned out around the world and new tyrannosaurs were found. But all of these tyrannosaurs were pretty similar to T-Rex. None of them were quite as big, but these were all fairly large predators that lived right at the end of the age of dinosaurs. And many of these are from North America. Albertosaurus, of course, named after Alberta in Canada. Gorgosaurus, Dasplitosaurus. Then people found some in Asia. This is Tarbosaurus, the closest relative of T-Rex. Lived in China and Mongolia when T-Rex lived in Asia. So people over the course of the 20th century started to learn more about tyrannosaurs, started to figure out that they were a more diverse group than just this one wacky oddball T-Rex. But we didn't really know that much. Really all that we knew adding to this picture was that there were a bunch of big predators living in North America and Asia at the end of the Cretaceous. We didn't know much about where they came from, how they evolved, how they changed over time, how they achieved such gigantic size. We literally really had no idea until very recently. Up until about 2000, so really just 15 years ago or so, this is what the family tree of tyrannosaurs looked like. We knew we had T-Rex, we knew we had some of these other big guys living at the end of the Cretaceous, we had other dinosaurs, and this was pretty much it. That is what the family tree of tyrannosaurs looked like at about the time that I entered high school. So we didn't really know that much at all. But things have changed. Things have really changed, and things are changing fast, and they continue to change because we are in the golden age of dinosaur discovery. These are just a few headlines from the last six months. People right now are finding a new species of dinosaur somewhere around the world on average of once a week. So about 50 new species of dinosaur every year. And that's not new fossils, that's not a new bone or a new skeleton, that's a totally new type of dinosaur that we never knew before. So the pace of discovery is tremendous. And a lot of these new dinosaurs are tyrannosaurs. And so these new discoveries have told us a whole lot. They have really helped us piece together the family tree of tyrannosaurs and understand the evolution of tyrannosaurs. One of the things they tell us is where tyrannosaurs fit in with all the other dinosaurs, where they fit on the dinosaur family tree. And it may surprise you, but actually, birds, of course, are dinosaurs. Some of you may, may know of this. Many, many feathered dinosaurs. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Birds are dinosaurs, very peculiar living dinosaurs that can fly, and tyrannosaurs actually are fairly close relatives to birds. They're not too far away. They're more closely related to birds than to almost any other type of dinosaur. Amazing. So T-Rex really wasn't some overgrown crocodile or lizard. It was a very bird-like animal. And we didn't really know this until these new discoveries over the past 15 years. But the other thing that these discoveries really allow us to do is finally flesh out this family tree of tyrannosaurs 
and tell the story of how they evolved. And it turns out to be a fascinating story, a very rich story, and I think a very unexpected story. And so what I'm going to do for in this talk is take you to three places where three very important new tyrannosaurs have been found, as well as some other tyrannosaurs alongside them. These are Russia, Mongolia, and China. Now, there are other tyrannosaurs still coming out of the US and Canada. There's even some tyrannosaurs in Europe. There are tyrannosaurs that have been found in England. There are a few species. And we even have a few bones from the middle Jurassic about 170 million years ago from Scotland, from the Isle of Skye, that are probably very early tyrannosaurs. But I'm not going to really talk about those because I want to be a little bit more exotic and take you a little bit further afield. So let's go to Asia and let's start building up this story of tyrannosaurs and their evolutionary history. So let's go to Russia first. This very small region of Russia, Siberia, a very important dinosaur was discovered less than five years ago. And it was discovered by this guy who I'm smiling next to, Sasha Avaranov. He's one of Russia's most senior paleontologists. He actually works more on mammals than on dinosaurs. He's an expert on those mammals that were living alongside the dinosaurs. But when he's screen washing to find his tiny little mammal teeth, occasionally he also finds a dinosaur. So he has to study the dinosaur, poor guy. And so when he was working with his team about five years ago in Siberia, they discovered a very interesting specimen. There's not a whole lot of it. Only a few bones from the skull. There's a few more bones of the lower jaw that aren't shown here. They were found later. There's a few bones of the neck and parts of the rest of the skeleton. Not a whole lot, but very clearly a new type of dinosaur, very clearly a meat-eating dinosaur, and very clearly a tyrannosaur. But an old tyrannosaur, about 167 million years old. 100 million years older than T. rex. This is the oldest tyrannosaur that we know about. And it's very different looking from T-Rex. I think that's pretty obvious. It's a lot smaller than T-Rex for one. It's only about the size of a human. And it doesn't have that big toothy skull of T-Rex. It has a much more delicate skull with the base of this very strange crest. Now, you can't really see most of the crest here, but we know it has a crest because a couple of other very close relatives of this Coleskis, this Russian Tyrannosaur, have also been found very recently. One in China with a huge crest, and there's a lot of bones of this guy. It's called Guanlong, also just about human size. And then once Guanlong was found and showed that you had tyrannosaurs at this very early age, and they had these weird crests, people went back to look at museum collections. And people noticed in the Natural History Museum in London, this specimen called Proceratosaurus discovered in 1910, only a few years after T. rex, nobody knew what it was. Nobody even thought it was a tyrannosaur. It was so much older than T. rex. It looked nothing like T. rex, at least to the naked eye. But when Guanlong was found, it was something of a Rosetta Stone. And immediately, people noticed the similarity. So we know that some of the earliest tyrannosaurs also were living in England. So it looks like we had these early tyrannosaurs 100 million years before T. rex in Russia, in China, in England, probably a globally distributed group. But these were not very big animals. These were not dominant animals. These were not animals at the top of the food chain. They were living in the shadow of other big predatory dinosaurs. So not very impressive dinosaurs these were. They probably look something like this. You'll notice, very fuzzy this dinosaur. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this, this is basically where T. rex came from. Interesting looking animal, but I don't think if you looked at this guy you would really ever draw a parallel to T. rex. I don't think you would ever predict that 100 million years down the line, that basically this kind of thing would evolve into a 13 meter long, five ton, top of the food chain killing machine. But that is what evolution did. So we can start now to put together this timeline in this family tree of tyrannosaurs. And this is what we saw before. Again, this is all we really knew up until about the year 2000. But now we can add in that tyrannosaurs evolved at least 100 million years before T. rex as very different types of animals. Small, fast running, not top of the food chain dinosaurs. 
and we can add these to the family tree. And we can see that there's these weird ones, small ones, with these crests very early on that are tyrannosaurs. And I should say we know they're tyrannosaurs because they share features of the skeleton that are only seen in T-Rex. They might be subtle things. You might not notice them immediately. But there are many features in common, including, I'll just throw out one, the bones of the snout are fused together in T-Rex and in other tyrannosaurs. They're also fused together in these dinosaurs. You don't see that in other dinosaurs. That's one of many features that tells us that although these things don't look a whole lot like T-Rex, they are tyrannosaurs. So we're starting to build up the family tree here, and let's keep adding to it. And let's go to China now, to this corner of northeastern China called Liaoning Province. This is part of Manchuria, tortured history over the last few hundred years, shares a border with North Korea. Interesting place. Not a place that tourists really ever get to, although it's not too far from Beijing. Beijing's just over here. I was there last week. This, I took this photo a week ago, a week ago last Thursday, from the train. This is what it looks like in the countryside there. Again, it's not the prettiest place in the world. Very industrial. Also, a lot of rolling hills and a lot of farmland. This is all farmland out there. There's even some fields here. Wheat, barley, but especially corn is grown in this area. And this is a place that in addition to having a lot of industry and a lot of farmland, is also a place that now produces what are probably the most incredible dinosaur fossils from anywhere in the world. And one of these is a new tyrannosaur described just two years ago called Eutyrannus. We'll get to you, Tyrannus in a second, but the reason why you, Tyrannus is so interesting, I mean, it's a new Tyrannosaur, that's interesting enough, but it's interesting because it has feathers on it. But that doesn't make you, Tyrannus unique. In fact, we now have thousands of fossils of dinosaurs covered in feathers from this area in Liaoning. And these are the primary evidence that dinosaurs were the ancestors of birds, that living birds came from dinosaurs. We not only have dinosaurs with feathers, but we have dinosaurs with wings. There's a dinosaur with a wing. Incredible. And very rare to get this kind of preservation. You can't just preserve feathers everywhere. These feathers are preserved because this area was full of volcanoes 125 million years ago. They would occasionally erupt, and Pompeii style would bury entire dinosaur ecosystems, preserving everything as a snapshot and burying everything so quickly that even the soft bits, like the feathers, would get preserved. Usually those decay away. But here we're lucky that we have them, and here, where we get that kind of preservation, we see that almost every type of dinosaur has some kind of feather. Some have these very quill pen type feathers, like living birds. Others have simpler feathers that look a lot more like hair. Well, one of these is Eutyrannus. People are finding new fossils of these feathered dinosaurs every day. And they're not really scientists that are finding the fossils. In fact, scientists don't even know where a lot of the best sites are. It's farmers, farmers working the land that find these fossils and sell them to museums. And this is a museum, the Jinjo Museum, where I was last week. And this is one of five storerooms that they have full of dinosaurs with feathers shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf. I can't tell you how many new species I just saw walking through. Incredible. Incredible. And literally every day farmers are finding new ones. This is a big part of the research I'm doing. We have a big collaboration with workers in China. And so the reason I was there last week was to work on this guy. This is a new feathered dinosaur, a very close relative of Velociraptor. And so this is something we're working on now and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to come out with this in a few months or so if all goes well. One of the guys I work with in China is this chap here. Xu Xing is his name. Probably the most famous dinosaur hunter in China right now. He's one of the uh, leaders at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing. And he has studied many of these feathered dinosaurs, including this one here. It's called Microraptor. It's a Velociraptor type animal with big feathers all over its arms and its legs. An incredible dinosaur, but not a tyrannosaur. A couple of years ago, Shu and his team worked on these fossils that they got from a farmer. And this probably doesn't look like much, but you can see probably some bones here and there. Maybe you can see these jaws up here with teeth. This 
is a new Tyrannosaur, which they called U. Tyrannus. Lived 125 million years ago and is quite a bit bigger than those little crested ones that we saw from Russia and from England and from earlier in China. This one's about eight or nine meters long, about a ton and a half is what it would have weighed. So nowhere near the size of T. rex, but a much bigger animal. Tyrannosaurs were diversifying. They were changing. They were doing more things by this time, about 40 million years or so after they originated. This is the skull. Really, really nice preservation, and there's multiple individuals. These look like they were social animals. They lived together just like many birds do today. But the great thing about U. Tyrannus is, as I mentioned, it is covered in feathers. Feathers that looked a lot like hair. So basically, this would have been a big fluff ball. All over its body, too. Not just a mohawk on its back or a little bit around its head or a little bit on the arms. All over the body, this thing was covered in feathers. And it's not the only feathered tyrannosaur from those rocks in Liaoning province. There's another one called D-Long that was actually found a few years earlier. And this is a much smaller tyrannosaur, tiny just about the size of a, of a terrier, really. And it is also covered in feathers, beautiful feathers. Here are some of the feathers. These are a couple of the tail bones, the individual vertebrae of the tail. And these things that look like scratches up on the top, those are feathers, simple feathers, feathers that look like hair. This is what the feathers of birds today with veins, the quill pen type feathers, this is what they evolved from. But these early dinosaurs had bodies covered in these types of feathers. So this is really leading to a total reimagination of what tyrannosaurs looked like. This, give or take, is probably what T. rex would have looked like. We don't have any feathers preserved in T. rex because in Montana, these places where Barnum Brown found his fossils, you didn't have volcanoes burying entire ecosystems. So feathers decayed, skin, muscles, all that stuff decayed. But if we had to guess, I think we would guess at something like this because we know that other tyrannosaurs, close relatives of T. rex, had feathers of this kind. So this famous fight scene between T. rex and Triceratops that you see in Jurassic Park and you see in museum exhibits and in basically every kid's book, it probably looked a little bit more like this and even the Triceratops probably had some kind of feathers. Incredible. So these things were big fur balls, big fluffy monsters, big birds from hell, whatever you want to call them a different vision of T. rex than we think. And you won't see this in the new Jurassic Park because they won't put feathers on it because they think people, you know, don't want to see them with feathers. <laughs> and, you know, maybe they're true because when the first Jurassic Park came out, 1993, those feathered dinosaurs weren't known. Those feathered dinosaurs were only first found in 1997. So less than 20 years ago. Until then, we had never found a dinosaur with feathers. Now we have thousands. So this is helping build up this Tyrannosaur evolutionary story even more. We can now add in that by kind of the early part of the Cretaceous, 125 million years ago or so, you had other Tyrannosaurs. Some of them were larger, like U. Tyrannus. Some of them, though, actually most of them were still small, and they were covered in feathers. And we can put them into the family tree and see that they kind of fall out around here. So intermediate, kind of between those very early primitive ones and the big T. rex-like ones from the end of the Cretaceous. But our story in China doesn't stop there because of course I have to talk about Pinocchio rex, which is one of our new discoveries that we announced earlier this year. And Pinocchio rex comes from a lot younger rocks, so rocks that are much closer in age to the present. It's about 66, 67 million years old. And it comes from farther south in, in China, near a city called Ganzhou. And it was here in 2010 at this site. So I'm standing here with my colleague, Yun Cheng Lu, another one of my very good friends and co-workers in China. He was also in the photo where we were studying that dromaeosaur, the, the, the raptor dinosaur with feathers at the museum in Liaoning. But here we are in southern China at basically what is a big building site. Looks to be that way because that's what it is. There's a building boom all across China, especially in this area. New buildings are going up everywhere. And they just so happen here, when they're building these buildings, this isn't soil. This is actually ground up mudstone or shale. This is rock. And this is rock that is about 66 or 67 million years old. And this rock that's full of dinosaur bone. So in 2010, 
One of the workers was working his digger, his backhoe, and hit something hard, which normally is a bad thing if you're building a building and you run into something hard. But they went down, they feared the worst, they thought the backhoe was broken or that they you know, ran into some bedrock or something like that. They cleared it away and they found that, oh, no, nothing to worry about, just a complete skeleton of a tyrannosaur. Just another day at work. Actually, it is kind of just another day at work in this part of China because there are many dinosaurs that they're finding. They're finding a lot of these very small bird-like dinosaurs. They're finding big long-necked dinosaurs. They're even finding lizards and lots of dinosaur eggs in these same rocks. So full of dinosaurs. So really every day they basically do find dinosaur bones, but this day they happen to find a complete skeleton of a tyrannosaur. And luckily, it made its way into this museum, the Ganjo Museum. And there's an incredible story here because when that tyrannosaur was found, as we saw earlier, 7.3 billion mobile phones in the world, all those workmen started to call people. And within 30 minutes, people from the museum had come, but also some poachers, some black market fossil dealers. It's a big problem. A lot of fossils from China you might see online on eBay in rock shops. These are illegal. You can't take fossils out of China, but there's a booming underground trade. And it was literally minutes that separated this fossil from being sold and going to the museum. But luckily it went into the museum. Amazing museum. This is one of the storerooms. It's like the size of an airplane hangar. This is Pinocchio Rex here, an eight or nine meter long dinosaur. And all of these are dinosaur nests, eggs of different kinds of dinosaurs. They have tens of thousands of dinosaur eggs in their collection. So an incredible place to work. But more interesting than the eggs is certainly the skeleton of this tyrannosaur, and it's an amazing skeleton. We have basically the entire skull. The teeth aren't preserved. It didn't have a beak or anything. It wasn't a beak tyrannosaur or anything like that. The teeth had fallen out, but almost all other parts of the skull are there, as well as most of the rest of the skeleton. Here's the neck. Here's part of the tail. These are a couple of bones of the legs. And so we have nearly a complete skeleton. We can tell that this thing was probably about eight or nine meters long, probably weighed a few tons, not quite T-Rex size, but a decent sized animal, but it wasn't fully grown. It was a teenager when it died. We think it looks something like this, and what really stands out is that it has this long skull, this long snout. That's why we gave it this cheeky little Pinocchio nickname, because this proper scientific name, Chongosaurus, and correct me e, if I'm mispronouncing, <laughs> It's very difficult to say. I've been corrected many, many times. So we thought a nickname would be in order. So because it has this long skull, we called it Pinocchio Rex. And this long skull really sets it apart from almost all other tyrannosaurs. T-Rex doesn't have a skull like that. T-Rex has a skull that's much shorter, much deeper, very robust, very muscular. Not Pinocchio Rex. And Pinocchio Rex also has a bunch of little horns on top of its skull, not like the horns of Triceratops, but kind of little bumps. And this is also very unusual. So this is a strange tyrannosaur, but very obviously a tyrannosaur. And this is a reconstruction that we had a really, really good artist in China do. A little bit psychedelic, rainbow colors, maybe. <laughs> Could be, we don't know. But this is basically what we think it was. It was a big bloodthirsty, predatory dinosaur, but probably not at the top of the food chain. It probably ate small lizards and some of these small feathered dinosaurs, but it actually lived alongside these Tarbosaurus dinosaurs, the Asian version of T-Rex, the 13 meter long, five or six tons one. So this was a tyrannosaur that was eight or nine meters long, weighed over a ton, but wasn't even the top predator in this ecosystem. And it wasn't only China where you had these strange long-snouted tyrannosaurs. So it turns out there's a few other fossils of long-snouted tyrannosaurs, and these have been mysterious for a long time. This is one called Eleoramus remotus. This is just a drawing of a few bones. There's part of the upper jaw, part of the snout, some of the lower jaw. Not much of it is known. It was discovered in Mongolia. It was discovered in the 70s, back during that time when we didn't know much about tyrannosaurs. Now, if people were able to interpret this right at the time, they actually would have learned something really unexpected about tyrannosaurs. But for various reasons, the specimen wasn't very accessible to researchers, other political issues, 
It's in the collection in Russia. You can imagine what may have happened in the 70s and the 80s when people would want to study this specimen. So it was out there. It was described in a Russian paper, but nobody really got to look at it. So it, people knew it was a tyrannosaur and could tell it was a little bit different from T. rex. Seemed to have a longer snout, but we really didn't know what to make of it. Well, that was until 2009. When in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, a new tyrannosaur was named. And this was from a team that was led by this guy here, dapper looking fellow, Andy Warhol lookalike, Mark Norell, who is my PhD advisor and also is in New York. Very eminent paleontologist, one of the world's great dinosaur experts. And for over 20 years, he has been leading a team, a joint American-Mongolian team, that every year goes to the Gobi Desert, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs, and finds new dinosaurs, digs them up. And so in 2001, somebody came across this, this jawbone sticking out of the rock, tyrannosaur bone. And so they took it out of the ground, and over the next few years, took it back to the lab and prepared it very carefully, took the bone out of the rock. And it turned out that this was a beautiful specimen, a nearly complete skull, but unlike Pinocchio rex, all of the bones are separated. Great brain case. These are the bones that surround the brain, protect the brain and the sense organs. Much of the rest of the skeleton, the neck, the back, the hind legs, a huge amount of material. And putting it all together, the skull looks something like this. Very unusual, long-snouted. It looks like Pinocchio rex. Of course, Pinocchio rex came a few years later, so we didn't know about Pinocchio rex at the time, but a very similar dinosaur. It turns out to be a very close relative of Pinocchio rex, but it's a new species, and we call this Aelioramus alti. And this is basically what its skeleton looks like. Again, these dinosaurs were not quite T. rex in size. They were eight or nine meters long, weighed one or two tons, living alongside the bigger tyrannosaurs. So huge dinosaurs, but not apex predators. We have studied this skeleton in gruesome detail, as we like to do. We love bones, so we study the hell out of bones. And we use whatever technology we can. So one of the things we did here was we used a CAT scanning to look inside those bones that surround the brain to get a look at what the brain would have looked like. And so this is basically the model that was reconstructed, these are all different sinuses. This is the brain. If we just look at the brain here, this is what the brain of a tyrannosaur would have looked like. And there's the ear, the inner ear. These are the different nerves coming out. So this is just, just kind of a taster. of. So you can see how paleontologists are really using very sophisticated tools these days. And this is something that, that basically all of my students are starting to use, and, and E is a very, very high-level user of CT scanning. So she's working on lizards and snakes using this technology here. Anyway, so it's not just finding bones and studying bones, but we're, we're using a lot of new technology. Just a taster. So these long-snouted tyrannosaurs then, they add more complexity. They help flesh out the family tree even more because now they tell us that during the very end of the age of dinosaurs, 66, 67, 68 million years ago, when T. rex was dominant in North America, when Tarbosaurus, this Asian version of T. rex, was at the top of the food chain in Asia, you also had some weird tyrannosaurs with long snouts, second tier predators, so you had diverse ecosystems with tyrannosaurs filling different roles. Tyrannosaurs weren't just top guns, even at the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And so we can add these into the family tree, and we can put them up here. And we actually see that they're very close relatives of T. rex. Although they look a bit different, that's because they kind of went on their own little evolutionary path. They're actually very, very close relatives of T. rex. And so this is basically where the Tyrannosaur family tree stands right now. This is a simplified version. We have about 30 different species now. So much greater than those five or six species we had only 15 years ago. And we could add in all the little twigs, and it wouldn't look so pretty as a, as a slide. But basically, this is, in general, what the family tree looks like. We have a lot of new tyrannosaurs from all over the world, many that I wasn't able to talk about. And of course, now that we have this ever-growing family tree, we can have fun with it, and we can use it to study evolution, which is really what we enjoy doing. And so what, then, 
is the evolutionary story of Tyrannosaurus. Where did T-Rex come from? Well, this is how the story is looking now. Tyrannosaurs were very diverse, very long evolutionary history. This wasn't just T-Rex living at the end of the age of dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurs were so much more than that. They originated more than 100 million years before T. rex lived. They are an ancient group of dinosaurs. We almost certainly had them in Scotland when these fossil-bearing rocks on the Isle of Skye were laid down. It's only a matter of time. Maybe the next time we go up to Skye, we'll find a Scottish Tyrannosaur, which would be incredible. They're a very, very, very old group with a rich history. But for most of that history, the first 80 million years or so, they were not very special. They weren't dominant animals. They weren't at the top of the food chain. Most of them were human-sized, fast runners, probably feeding on small prey, living in the shadow of other types of dinosaurs that were at the top of the food chain, more primitive dinosaurs that were the top predators. Sure, there were a few tyrannosaurs, like that big fuzzy Eutyrannus from China, that were a little bit bigger, but nothing like the size of T. rex. So 80% or more of the history of tyrannosaurs, there wasn't really that much to them. They were doing well, they were living all over the place, they were diverse, they were evolving, but they were not dominant in any sense of the word. They only became these colossal apex predators at the very, 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 very end of the time of dinosaurs. Only about 20 million years before that asteroid hit did tyrannosaurs become huge and become at the top of the food chain. And only in North America and Asia, by the way. There were no tyrannosaurs in Europe at that time. There were no tyrannosaurs in the southern continents at that time. So really, tyrannosaurs were a pretty localized group, but in those local regions, they were the top dogs. They were apex predators. And they were doing very well until one day one Tuesday morning, or Wednesday morning, or whatever morning, something 10 kilometers wide fell out of the sky, smashed into Mexico, what is now Mexico, and wiped out all of the dinosaurs except for birds. So the reign of tyrannosaurs came to a very sudden, very abrupt, very unexpected end. So I think tyrannosaurs tell us something very interesting about evolution. For most of their history, they weren't very special. You would have never predicted back 170 million years ago that they would evolve into something like T-Rex. And then T-Rex came into being, it evolved, it became a top predator, and then bam, one day it was wiped out. And really, I think this is how evolution works. Nothing predestined, nothing preordained. You never know what paths evolution is going to take. So even something as incredible, as iconic, as dynamic, as amazing as T-Rex, was really just kind of the tip of the iceberg of this long history of a group that had been pretty pathetic for a long time, and then it was struck down in its prime. But that's why we're here. That's why mammals had our chance to diversify. So with that, thank you for paying attention to tyrannosaurs, and of course, I'm very happy to take any questions that you have. I'm not sure uh, if it's still accepted that um, structures that look the same kind of had completely separate evolutionary origins, like the octopus eye and the mm. mammalian eye. I'm just wondering how we know that things that look, look like feathers on dinosaur um, uh, fossils have got anything to do with things that we call feathers on birds. Yeah, so it depends on which feathers you're talking about. I don't think anybody would debate anything about these quill pen type feathers. You have dinosaurs like Velociraptor type dinosaurs that had wings with feathers that looked like you could just pluck one off and start writing with it. So there's no question about those. The ones with hair, the hairy looking feathers, you know, maybe you could have a question about that. They don't look a lot like feathers today. Well, they kind of, but they actually kind of do. Birds have lots of different kinds of feathers, and there are very simple feathers, down feathers and other types in birds today that are very, very similar to those simple hair-like feathers. There's also things you can do developmentally. You can tweak the DNA of birds and make them grow these very simple feathers. And with the fossil feathers, you can look at their microstructure under the microscope, and you can find that they have the same structure, basically internally, as bird feathers do today. So that is, is kind of the nutshell of, of why we're pretty confident that these things are absolutely feathers.
You mentioned something about all these uh, dinosaurs in different places around the world, but the world was very different 100 million years ago. What, uh, you know, what does that have to do with the, in the interplay of the distribution of the different species? And yeah, yeah. Well, when Tyrannosaurus first originated, 170 million years ago or so, the continents were much closer together. You know, this wasn't Pangaea time. Pangaea had started to split up before, but most of the continents were still connected, which is probably why these Tyrannosaurs lived everywhere. By 66 million years ago, the continents basically looked like they do today, which is probably why you only had Tyrannosaurs in certain parts of the world, North America and Asia at that time. So there's no question that the drifting continents played a big role in how Tyrannosaurs were distributed and probably were a major driver of their evolution as well. Uh, birds have a very distinctive breathing system, very, very distinct from lizards or mammals. Do we have any evidence of uh, how dinosaurs breathed? Did they have a bird-type system? And does this have any explanatory power over their rise? Yes, is the answer to that question. Uh, yes and yes. We do know how they breathed, at least generally, and they did have a bird-like system. And we know that because the respiratory system leaves marks on the bones. So birds have a lung, a very efficient type of lung that's unidirectional. And I probably need an engineer to explain it. But the way it works is oxygen actually goes across the tissues of the lung, both when the bird breathes in and when it breathes out. And there's a system of air sacs that basically shunt air to different parts of the body that allow that to happen. Those air sacs invade the bones. They need places to go in the skeleton. And so we see in living birds where those air sacs go into bones. We see what that looks like. We see the holes in the bones, very characteristic size and shape and distribution and placement. And we see the same things in not all dinosaurs, but basically all of the carnivorous dinosaurs and also the long neck dinosaurs. So T. rex, we have its bones. It has those marks where those air sacs go into the bones. It would have had a bird-like lung, which is incredible. I was just wondering, uh, could you explain how it is that the event in Mexico wiped out the dinosaurs? Ah, with pleasure, yes. So this is... I'm really <laughs> glad you asked that. That's what I was going <laughs> to ask. This is one of the things that, you know, we've been studying. And, and we had a new study come out a few months ago where we took a fresh look at this question. Because there is a lot of debate. We know an asteroid or a comet, one or the other, hit 66 million years ago. No question. We have a crater, all kinds of other evidence. But there has been a question about whether that killed off the dinosaurs or whether maybe this was a coincidence and dinosaurs were on their way out anyway. A lot of different thoughts. Hard to test, of course, because this was a long time ago and the fossil record is very biased. But one thing that we can do and which we did was look at evolutionary trends in dinosaurs over time, especially over the last 20 million years or so of the Cretaceous period. Using all, you know, the most updated records of dinosaurs, again, we're finding so many new ones every year that our data set's getting better and better, but also we have a lot more sophisticated techniques now, statistical techniques to look at evolutionary trends, to take into account biases in the fossil record. And so we did this, this very updated analysis and we found absolutely no evidence for any kind of long-term declines or anything like that. Dinosaurs were doing well when the asteroid hit, but there's a little bit of a twist and that during the last few million years before the asteroid hit, just a few million years, a few groups of dinosaurs were kind of waning a little bit in their diversity. And those were the big plant eaters. Those were the horn dinosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs, the base of the food chain dinosaurs. So it looks like, and some ecological modeling has, has suggested this, it looks like those ecosystems with fewer big plant eaters at the base of the food chain were a bit more susceptible to collapse if something happened. And so it just so happened that that's what those ecosystems were when the asteroid hit. If the asteroid hit a few million years earlier, maybe it wouldn't have been so severe. If it hit a few million years later, when those dinosaurs surely would have recovered their diversity as they always had for 150 million years, maybe they would have been in a better position to survive. So the asteroid did it, no doubt. It was sudden, no doubt. But this very short-term diversity decline of just a few types of dinosaurs seems like it made their ecosystems a little bit more vulnerable and probably made that asteroid even more serious when it hit. I don't know which way to ask this question, but wh why did some dinosaurs get so big? Or why have mammals not got so big? Because uh, mammals at the top of the food chain, carnivorous mammals, 
are nothing like as big as these very large dinosaurs. And have there always been very large uh, dinosaurs of the size of Tyrannosaurus at the same time there have been small ones? Yeah, so this is one of those questions about dinosaurs that we are always wondering about. How did some of them get so big? Because some of these dinosaurs are just totally out of the range of anything alive today. A, a T-Rex would be one. I mean, the biggest predator today is a polar bear, which is big. You wouldn't want to run into one, but it's nothing like a T-Rex. But not to mention the big plant-eating dinosaurs, the big long neck ones. Some of these things probably weighed 70 or 80 tons and were 35, 40 meters long. Nothing like that today. So there's a lot of research on this. There's a lot of competing ideas. But I think it was probably a cocktail of things that allowed dinosaurs to get so big. Their biology was probably part of it. They pr probably were not quite as warm-blooded as living mammals, so they didn't probably need as, as, as much in terms of resources and food. They could grow pretty fast as well. They could grow faster than, than a lot of mammals today, or at very least kind of a similar rate. So they were able to get big fast. They were living in a world that was much warmer, there was more oxygen, all kinds of things like this. Uh, so it was probably a number of things that allowed them to get big, and also the lungs may be an important part of this story because those air sacs can hollow out bones and actually save a lot of weight in the skeleton. Mammals can't do that. We have sinuses in our skulls, but we can't reduce weight in the rest of our skeleton by sending air sacs into our vertebrae and into our femurs and stuff. So this actually may have been something that you, you know, might not think of, maybe a trivial little thing, but it could have been a very important part of that cocktail. So I think the, the short answer is it was probably a lot of things that combined, both biological things and also environmental things that allowed dinosaurs just to do things very differently than mammals. Thank you, Steve. I don't think I've ever been um, to a lecture about dinosaurs. I've heard them described as big fluffy monsters before. <laughs> it's put a whole different take on dinosaurs from whatever just I've Just remember had. that in your nightmare. I will, I will, <laughs> I will. Um, <laughs> But you have your absolute enthusiasm for your subject has shone through tonight. And you, you said we were in a golden age of dinosaur mm -hmm. discovery, and you are obviously relishing that, <laughs> and you've really shared your passion and enthusiasm with us. So I'd like to ask everybody to thank Dr. Steve Boucher. Yeah, thank you.